Okay, I think most of the children and young people have, have disappeared. Uh, Rupert is going to speak again today. It's the second part of his Under Pressure series. Uh, hopefully you have seen or listened to the first part. If you missed it, it will be on the website. Uh, he says that this Sunday is going to be more upbeat than, than last Sunday. Uh, so I'm just going to pray, the, or well, I'm going to read it and then I'm going to pray with Rupert. The reading is from Mark 14, and today we're just going to focus on verses 32 to 42, which is Jesus prays in Gethsemane. They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, Sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further and fell to the ground. He prayed that, if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned and found his disciples asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them again and prayed the same prayer as before. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open, and they didn't know what to say. When he returned to them the third time, he said, Go ahead and sleep, have your rest. But no, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. So yeah, I just want to pray, God, that today, as Rupert shares on this passage and just what you've put on or what you've put on his heart, that I'll just be able to share with him, with us, some of uh, what you've conveyed to him, and that we'll just be open to what you've got to say. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Roy, for reading that. Uh, it's funny, isn't it, when you read a passage a number of times and then you read it again and something strikes you? It's like the disciples are asleep and then Jesus goes, Simon, are you asleep? Anyway, hadn't noticed that before. There you go. It's not what we're going to focus on this morning. So this is part two. I said last time that this was a little bit like one of those TV programs where... Um, you, uh, the whole series is not downloaded in one go, you know, old school, and you have to wait for Sunday night and nine o'clock for the second episode, and they leave you at the end of the first episode where everything that's gone wrong could possibly go wrong, and then it all gets resolved a little bit in the next episode. So last week was really all the bad news, and I'm just going to give a really brief uh, very, very brief recap, but if you're interested, it's all online. You can listen to it or watch it again. And then this week, we're going to move into some good news uh, of how do we live when we're under pressure. And uh, last week, I was saying that the context of this story is that uh, the disciples and Jerusalem, the whole place was a huge amount of tension and pressure and stress. They were occupied. The religious leaders felt their power was at threat. They were trying to find ways of killing Jesus. The disciples thought Jesus was going to be this person who was going to bring freedom from the Roman occupation. Everybody was feeling very very tense. And it's a little bit like maybe our wider context. We've lived through two years of quite a lot of tension and pressure and stress. Many of us may have experienced that very differently, and it doesn't seem to be changing. Uh, and we've got a war in Europe. We've got a threat of nuclear weapons being used. We've got cost of living. We've got um, increase in fuel prices. We've got all kinds of things that are going on, let alone the things that are happening in our own lives. And so last time we talked a little bit about when we're under pressure, things tend to come out. And we, and we sometimes go, oh, where did that come from? 
uh, in the way that we react to things. And uh, I use this little image of a toothpaste uh, that when we put toothpaste under pressure, what comes out is what's already inside there. And so what tends to come out when we're under pressure is what's already inside us. Sometimes pressure, stress, tension reveals what's really going on in our hearts. It's not meant to condemn us, it's meant to be helpful information for us. And there are three patterns that um, we used in this slightly wider passage that we read last time that are uh, noticeable noticeable patterns, and uh, people have recognized these patterns emerged. There may be other models that you're familiar with. I found this model very helpful. The three patterns would be uh, that we often uh, find that we react very defensively. No, not me! I would never do that. I can't, can't believe you're thinking well, um, that, that I would do that. I would never do that. We can be, react very defensively or we can attack. I can't believe that you're raising this with me when you're just as bad. And so the language tends to change from me to you and finger pointing and blame. Uh, and the third pattern tends to be one of withdrawal, which can be a physical withdrawing. We actually literally withdraw from people or situations, or it can be an emotional or mental uh, withdrawing. And so these are three uh, patterns. Uh, last time, uh, I was going to use this quote that, that comes up um, just now, and there's a second part which we'll come to at the end. And uh, it comes from a, the foreword in a book, Being with God, by A.J. Sherrill, which I've referenced in the past. Uh, a really helpful, I love the subtitle of this, The Absurdity, Necessity, and Neurology of Contemplative Prayer. Uh, and the foreword is written by a chap called um, Rich Philodus, who uh, leads uh, a church in New York, which is actually the church where emotionally healthy spirituality comes from. And uh, he's written a book called The Deeply Formed Life, but he writes the forward in this book and he says in this forward uh, about the church in general and our sense of mission and he says instead of offering the fruit of a place of sustained prayerful abiding in Christ we are being offered in the church and therefore offering what we're offering into the world in our mission the fruit of reactivity anxiety and simplistic solutions for a vastly complicated world. So there's the bad news. We all tend to react in these ways when under pressure what comes, what's in our heart comes out uh, and that we are tend to um, be offering fruit of reactivity, anxiety and simplistic solutions. So today I'm going to offer some ways in which we can respond uh, about being under pressure. Uh, I'm not going to say everything. There's loads more that could be said. I'm going to just spring out of this passage and say a few things that I think are helpful. We're going to look at what did Jesus do in this passage when he was under enormous pressure, and then what does he invite the disciples into? So firstly, let's look at Jesus's response. I think this will come up on the next slide. There's a couple of verses here where it says that Jesus was deeply troubled and distressed. And uh, in the next verse, it says his soul was crushed with grief to the point of death. Now, if anybody came and said that to us uh, in a pastoral context in the church, we would be deeply worried about them. We'd be concerned about their mental health and their ability to cope. We might be thinking, gosh, they're on the verge of a breakdown or anxiety attack or something like that. Jesus is under an enormous amount of pressure. And it's quite a strong statement, isn't it? His soul, he's saying, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. He's under this huge amount of pressure. And then as we read this story, we see that Jesus starts praying. He says, if there's any other way, Father, if there's any other way, would you please help me to bypass this suffering, this um, death that lies ahead for him? It seems that at this particular moment, the reality of the situation has caught up with Jesus. He's aware of what lies ahead for him in the next few hours. And his desire was to find a different way. What he really wanted, what he was praying was, Lord, if there's any other way, I'd love to find it, please. Please. 
<laughs> if there's a plan B, now's the time, Father. So his desire was to find a different way, but his choice or his will was to go the way that the Father wanted. Sometimes when we're under pressure or stress, our, a, a desire may emerge for us to react in certain ways, but we know it's not a helpful way to go. And we can choose another path, a better path, even if it is a path that means we journey into and stay with the pain and the stress of the pressure that we find ourselves in. Jesus chose the difficult path to stay with the pressure and the stress. In one of the other Gospels, he says, I could, I could have called a thousand angels to come to my aid. He had all kinds of other options available to him that he may have wanted in his desire. Father, if there's any other way, please. But he chose to walk the path into and stay with the pressure, the stress, and the pain. You see, when we attack, defend, or withdraw, we feel better. Right? Yeah, it feels good. I mean, let's just take it with withdrawal. That's a really easy one to illustrate. When we withdraw from a pressurized situation, we feel better, right? For a moment. We feel better for a time. That withdrawal might literally be taking ourselves out of a pressurized situation, or that withdrawal might be a mental or emotional withdrawal. But in that moment, we feel better, which is why we do it. It releases the pressure. When you're feeling under pressure or stress, if somebody, it feels like there's a threat and somebody is attacking us in some way, actually, it feels good to defend myself. No, I'd never do that. I didn't do that. Can't believe you think I would do that. Or it feels better to attack someone else, which is why we end up blaming so many people. You know, 15 years ago, everything was the banker's fault. Now, it's probably, I don't know, the politicians, Brexit, Putin. As long as we've got somebody to blame, we feel better, right? So, Jesus had all kinds of different options that would have alleviated some of the pain of the situation that he was in. He could have called these thousand of angels to come and defend him at that moment in time. And his desire was to avoid the suffering, if at all possible. But his choice was to go the way of the Father. Even though that meant staying with and journeying through the stress and the pressure that he was in. Sometimes it's just helpful to choose a different way. I find this model really helpful of just being aware of my tendency that I can withdraw, attack, and defend. And just being aware of that means that sometimes I can choose to do something different. Even when internally I'm thinking, I could quite happily knock their block off just at the moment. <laughs> but actually I can make a different choice. I can choose to be curious about what's happening, what they're saying, what, et cetera, et cetera. So, firstly we see Jesus choosing the difficult, painful path to journey in and through the pain of the stress and pressure that he was there. And that is a really helpful thing for us. But it's also exhausting. If we're doing that all the time, it's exhausting. And so I think what Jesus invites us into is a more profound, deeper transformation and change, where instinctively we react in different ways or we respond in different ways. Instinctively, we don't attack, withdraw, and defend in the same way. 
And that's what I think he does here with these disciples. Again, there's much more that we could say, many other things that we could do to uh, change our instinctive reaction and this deeper transformation. But I just want to spin out of this passage, and I think it's fascinating what Jesus invites the disciples into. And we see this, and we pick this up in verse 34. Again, I think it will come up on one of the slides. And Jesus says... He invites the disciples sit here while I go and pray. Uh, No, sorry, that's not the one. Where is that? Couldn't you even, couldn't you watch with me even one hour, says Jesus. Watch, keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Watch and pray. That's the invitation that Jesus gives these disciples. Watch and pray. Now, what does this mean? Is Jesus actually saying to the disciples, I want you to watch out for the attackers, the, the, um, the, the people that are going to come and arrest me, and give me a warning. Is that the kind of watching that he's asking for here? Or, or perhaps is it a watching so that the disciples could stay and comfort Jesus in the midst of his distress? Was this watching in some way for the benefit of Jesus? Well, if we read this carefully, we actually realize it wasn't for the benefit of Jesus at all, because it says, so that you will not fall into temptation. This watch and pray was for the benefit of the disciples themselves. This was to help them. Help them journey through stress and pressure, to help them grow as disciples of Jesus, to help them grow as human beings. It was for their benefit. It was to help them. Keep watch. Now, there's a wonderful old Teze song, you know, watch and pray, remain with me and watch and pray. And it's, if you've been around church circles, you'll have heard this phrase, watch and pray, a lot maybe. But what does it mean? What does watch and pray actually mean? So let's dive in and have a look at these two words, watch and pray. Firstly, watch. So this word watch could mean stay alert. Just in the previous chapter, in Mark chapter 13, Jesus tells this little parable about a man, an owner, who leaves his house and goes on a long trip. And he leaves behind his servants, and he gives them some tasks, and he says to the gatekeeper on his estate, I want you to keep watch for my return. You are to keep watch for his return, Mark chapter 13 and verse 34. It repeats that phrase about three times in that short little parable. It could be, well, so literally it could be translated stay alert or be attentive. As I've been musing on this, I think in our current kind of language and and vocabulary that we use, we might use the phrase, be present. I want you to be present. Be present to this moment. Be attentive. Attacking, defending, and withdrawal is all ways to avoid being present to this moment. Jesus is inviting his disciples to be attentive, to be present, be present to all that is happening at this moment in time, to stay with the pain of the present moment, to stay with the uncomfortableness of the pressure or the stress. This, I think, is a really challenging Invitation to stay. So it is good news. There is good news here, but it's challenging good news, okay? It's to stay with the pressure and the pain of that moment, not to try and alleviate it by attacking, withdrawing, and defending, but to stay present, be attentive, stay alert, stay in the present moment. But actually, that's really hard to do, isn't it? 
really, really hard to do. One of, the, one of the things I, in the last two years, I've been trying to do is just stay with the uncomfortableness of whatever it is that I'm feeling at any particular moment. Just stay with that. Everything in me wants to run away from it, to alleviate that pain somehow. But just to stay with it, because it is as we stay and journey through some of those things that we find light at the end of the tunnel. We need to stay. So the first thing is watch which could be stay, stay alert, be present, be attentive to this present moment. The second thing, which is where we find the help, is not not just be present in some kind of new age or ethereal way, but to pray. Now, when we use the word prayer, particularly in some Christian traditions, what we often mean when people kind of say, we need to pray more. Anyone heard that? We need to pray more. Generally, we all feel really guilty. So please, if you're feeling guilty, that's not my goal or intention just now. When people say we need to pray more, what they really mean is we need to be interceding and asking God more for things. And so in, particularly in our evangelical charismatic traditions, um, when we use the word prayer, we often mean intercession. But actually in the Bible and in lots of other traditions, prayer means a much bigger thing than that. It's much bigger than that. Yes, of course there's a place for petition, intercession, asking for God for things, but prayer is a much bigger thing. So when we read the word prayer, don't think intercession. Think dwelling. Think being with God. Being in the presence of God. Now, often some kind of petition will emerge as we are sitting there in the presence of God, some kind of prayer. Jesus, we find that happens in this story. He sits in the presence of God and then eventually, you know, he's he's saying, can you not even watch for one hour? So all we have is a prayer that takes about 15 seconds to say, can you not take this cup of suffering away from me, please, Lord? Presumably the other 59 minutes and 45 seconds is waiting in the presence of God. So prayer is about dwelling, which includes intercession, but is not limited to it. To dwell in the presence of God. Now, I want to say something about spiritual practices. Spiritual practices can be used as a way of avoiding being in the pain of the present moment. We can use spiritual practices to avoid the pain of the present moment. We can use prayer, serving in church, coming to church gatherings, worship, scripture, all kinds of spiritual practices are ways of avoiding the pain of the present moment. For example, there used to be a worship leader here, um, I can't remember who, so I'm not... um, and they're no longer here, they no, or at least they no longer say it. So, if it was you, please, no condemnation. But I don't think it was. Anyone here? He used to be a worship leader. He used to say, please leave your problems at the door and come and worship Jesus today. In other words, come and worship and forget about real life. No, 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 no. No. I almost feel like being ruder, like... (laughs) No! True worship is saying that in the midst of the hardships, the pain, the trials, the pressures, when things crowd in me, in on me, in the midst of the grief, I'm still going to worship you. In the midst of the questions, the doubts and the uncertainties, I'm still going to worship you, even though I may not fully understand the you that I am worshipping. In the midst of what is going on in our lives, we're called to worship. That's true worship. When we leave our problems at the door, we're using worship as an escape from the pain of the real moment. We can do that with all kinds of spiritual practices. I am not inviting us into those kinds of spiritual practices. 
I am inviting us into spiritual practices that allows us to dwell, to stay in the midst of some of the pressure, the stress, the disappointments, the dreams, the hopes and the fears, the joys and the sorrows, and we bring them all into the presence of Jesus and we sit with them in the presence of God. One of, one of my practices is that I read a psalm, two psalms a week. I read them for about three or four days. The psalm for the last few days has been Psalm 91. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I've been really struck by live and rest. If you live... If you live in the shelter of the Most High, if that becomes your home, then you will find rest. That's the kind of dwelling, being in the presence of Jesus we're talking about. In the midst of time, uh, in the midst of pressures and stress and whatever is going on in our lives. Now, back to this text in Mark 14, what Jesus says is watch and pray. So stay present to this present moment, be attentive, be alert to what is going on at this moment, even when it's really painful, and dwell in the presence of God so that you will not give in to temptation. What was the temptation that these disciples were facing? Well, what we see here is really interesting little parallel. How many times did Jesus, how many times did Peter deny Jesus? How many times did the disciples fall asleep? Three. So what we're meant to see here is the parallel between these two stories. They fall asleep three times, Jesus, uh, Peter denies Jesus three times. The temptation that Peter actually gives into was to not stay present to the pain of that moment, but to alleviate his pain by denying Jesus. He felt better after it for a moment. Then he felt awful. But at that moment, denying Jesus was a good move for him because he felt better. That was the temptation. So if Jesus, Jesus was saying to Peter and is saying to us, watch and pray, stay present, dwell in the presence of God, and then maybe you wouldn't give in to the temptations that are there for us. So Jesus recognizes this tension that was within us. He says the spirit is willing, but the body or flesh is weak. There are these two competing forces within us. Part of us that wants to do the right thing, the best thing, the most helpful thing, which means journeying in and through the pain. And there's another part of us that really wants to alleviate the pain by attacking, defending, and withdrawing. Which one's going to win? This is not a quick fix. This is not an invitation just to, in that moment of stress and pressure, just to be present in that moment and to pray. This is an invitation to a long journey of discipleship and transformation. When we make it our lifestyle, it will change you. When we make this a regular part and pattern of our lives, of learning to be attentive to this present moment, and when we learn how to dwell in the presence of God, it will transform us. It may not transform us in the first day, the first week, the first month, the first year, sometimes not even in the first decade. But if we do this regularly, it will transform us. Little by little, we will be transformed into the ever-increasing likeness of Jesus. In November... 2019, the Lord spoke to me and he said, this was, this uh, makes it sound like a really dramatic thing. It was this kind of emerging sentence that emerged over a few weeks. I felt like the Lord was saying, Rupert, if you want to go deep, if you want to go wider, you have to go deeper. If you want to go wider, if you want to 
carry more, you have to go deeper. If you want to go wider, you have to go deeper. If I don't go deeper, the wider will kill me. But like a tree, shallow roots, the winds come, tree falls over. If you want to go wider, you have to go deeper. So, Rich Velodas finishes this quote with this, which I think is fantastic. Instead of the fruit, so this is the first half, instead of the fruit from a place of sustained, prayerful abiding in Christ, we're being offered and therefore offering the fruit of reactivity, anxiety, and simplistic solutions for a vastly complicated world. I mean, that just rings true, right? So, what the world, and more importantly, the church, he goes on to say, next slide, desperately needs are people who have been with God. That's it. That's all the church needs. That's all the world needs. This is so simple. It's not quick, but it is simple. What we need is people who have been with God, people who can offer a quality of presence that disrupts the violent pace that swallowed many people whole. A presence shaped by contemplation. Gosh, I think we live in such a violent world in its pace, in its activity, in its drivenness, spits people out because they're no longer useful. And the church, when we're not driven by anxiety and reactivity, can offer something incredible to the world when we learn how to be with God and are shaped by contemplation. Now, this, I think, is what we're looking for in CCE. We probably haven't said this explicitly, but I want to say it really explicitly today. Our roots are evangelical charismatic. We draw heavily on the charismatic stream. And that is a wonderful and brilliant spirituality of the imminence of the presence of God, of the work of the Spirit, of the gifts of the Spirit. Sure, there's all kinds of charismatic culture and excesses which has been really unhelpful, but at its best, this is a brilliant stream that has enlivened many people's faith, my own included. And that is something that we are still deeply committed to If you're here and you're joining us in the last wee while and you haven't had a charismatic or this is new for you, then please dive in, ask questions, explore about the work of the Spirit that brings life to us in new and fresh and amazing ways. But we want to be not just charismatic but also hold the contemplative together. I have a friend of mine who's a church leader who's going through the most difficult trial and hardship at the moment. And he, he said the other day when we were talking about these two strands of spirituality and faith, and his experience and practice has all been in the charismatic stream of spirituality for the last X number of years. And he said, when I've hit this crisis, I've realized that my charismatic practices are not enough. I need something more. And he's learning and exploring about contemplative prayer, about silence and stillness and solitude, and some of the classic spiritual practices that Christians have been engaging with for thousands of years. Often they're drawn from Catholic spirituality or Ignatian spirituality, but they are practices that have shaped and formed Christians all around the world for 2,000 years. And I believe that we as a church want to hold together the charismatic and the contemplative. They're not in opposition. We hold them together because both of them will deeply form us as human beings. When we're under pressure 
and what might come out is a spurt of toothpaste. We need all the help we can get to be formed into the image of Christ. The charismatic and the contemplative. You may find that at this particular moment you're particularly drawing and benefiting from one or two of those, one of those or the other one. And that's absolutely fine. If you find that you're in a charismatic phase and you're just loving the worship and corporate expressions and gifts and prayer ministry and laying on of hands, fantastic, go for it. If you're in a place where silence and stillness and solitude and, and fasting and, you know, fasting, other things like that, brilliant. We want to hold both of those together because we're deeply committed to forming people in the image of Jesus. People fully human, fully alive. And I don't know about you, but I need all the help I can get. I've profoundly found helpful contemplative prayer in the last season. It's been profoundly changing for me. But I'm not reneging on the charismatic. Sure, some of the excesses of both of those strands we don't want. We want to draw on the best of all of them. So we're not leaving aside our charismatic roots, but we do want to be offering how we can be shaped by contemplation and contemplative prayer that helps us to learn how to dwell in the presence of God, not rushing away like one of our charismatic songs has sung in the past. And what I love about this quote from Rich Velodas is that actually mission will flow from our dwelling and transformation of being in the presence of God. We have something to offer to a world because we've been changed by being with Jesus. We're not just offering words. Words are helpful and important, but they're inadequate and insufficient on their own. We're offering ourselves that have come into the presence of God, and we have been changed and are being changed. We're not the finished product. We can be totally open and honest about all our flaws and all the things that we're still working in and through. But we also have a story to tell of how the presence of God and learning how to dwell in the presence of God has changed us. And we're offering that to a world. Our mission will flow from our dwelling and our being. And I passionately believe that for us as a church, for us to be a place where the presence of God dwells amongst us in powerful and profound ways, Not just when we gather here in the King's Hall or in small groups or other contexts around the city or beyond, but as we, we, in our own individual lives, learn how to dwell in the presence of Jesus day by day, being transformed by the Spirit who is with us so that we are a community that knows how to host the presence of God in our individual and our corporate lives. That will propel us into mission where we have something that is profound to offer to a world that's desperately looking for solutions about how can you live differently, that isn't driven and anxious, reactive, and all the rest. So we want to pursue gathering as a community. Maybe you're just checking us out at the moment. Maybe you're joining us online and you're Wondering, is this a church community that you could be part of? If this in any way inspires you, can I invite you to come and be part of this community as we gather together? Over a long haul, this isn't instant quick fix spirituality. I wish I had a magic wand sometimes that I could wave and make things better, but it just doesn't work like that. We have to journey in and through the pain, and we do it together in the presence of God, And so if this inspires you in any way, come and join in with our community. We want to be this community that gathers around Jesus, that we can see us becoming more fully human, more fully alive, more who we're meant to be. And then we go 
carrying this presence into our workplaces, into our neighborhoods, into our local areas. And there's all kinds of things that can emerge that's much more dispersed than the gathered community on a Sunday. Where we take the good news that Jesus is present, he's with us, the kingdom of God has come. And we can be transformed because Jesus is here and we know how to learn and we're learning how to be attentive and present to this present moment and we're learning how to pray, to be, to dwell in the presence of God. I'd like to just finish by engaging with an ancient practice for a few minutes before we then say the creed and bread and wine. My sense is as we take bread and wine I, I, I just want to see the spirit move amongst us as we take bread and wine. That we're a place where the presence of God dwells amongst us as we gather together. So we're going to finish by taking bread and wine. But just now I'd like us to just take two or three minutes. We're not, I'm not going to do any dialogue around the sermon today, but just to do an ancient practice of imagining ourselves in the story. This is a bit of a mashup of several ancient practices. It's a Rupert mashup. So find a comfortable place. I think Roy or one of you, would you mind reading this scripture again? We're going to read it a couple of times and we're going to have a minute of silence just in between. And what I'd like to, as you listen to this scripture again, I'd like to invite you to imagine yourself in this scripture. Imagine Jesus. You could be a disciple, you could be an onlooker, you could be a bird in a tree. You could be one of the guards that are coming to arrest Jesus. Just imagine this scene. You're in the garden, it's night time, Garden of Gethsemane. Tension is high in the city. Tension is high amongst the disciples. And then as we read this scripture a couple of times, just allow this imaginative scene to unfold in your mind. And I want to ask this question, what is Jesus inviting you into? They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, Sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and fell to the ground. He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned and found the disciples asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them again and prayed the same prayer as before. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open and they didn't know what to say. When he returned to them the third time, he said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But know the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Luke, my betrayer, is here. They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, 
James and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and fell to the ground. He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned and found the disciples asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them again and prayed the same prayer as before. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open and they didn't know what to say. When he returned to them the third time, he said, go ahead and sleep, have your rest, but know the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here.